Okay, Acts 21, verse 31. When Paul came to Jerusalem, um, he underwent incredible persecution. Anytime you think he got trouble, remember what I said? Read 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, and you will see 35 things that Paul was in that were nothing but incredible problems. Are you there? Okay. If you don't tune in in the first like two minutes of class, you've missed the whole thing, basically. It's, it's like... It's like mental uh, discipline to listen and uh, to hear. So from Acts 21, we, we covered Paul's defense and how he gave a defense of those five aspects of the ministry. And he continued to do it from Acts 21 right through 26. And also inside of these chapters, not going verse by verse like we would like to at some point, but we're not a lot of the time to do that. We see a culmination or the end of what I would call a tremendous uh, grace escape. That Paul would make us, Paul was really, because of who God is, always able to escape. And Proverbs chapter 16, verse 1, it talks about uh, the many plans and thoughts and preparation of a man, but the answer is from the Lord. The answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So man has all kinds of things he devises in Proverbs 19, verse 4. He devises many things, but the counsel of the Lord it shall stand. So there was a lot of people making plans and preparations and doing everything they could. And this verse in uh, 21-31, and as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. So it says that they were trying to kill Paul. This was the objective of the devil. To what? To kill Paul. To kill, Paul. Get, kill Paul, get him out of the way, and uh, things are going to be okay. That's what the enemy thinks. And we see this statement repeated in Acts 23, verse 12, 14, 15, 21, and 27. I'll say it again. Acts 23, verses 12. 14, 15, 21, and 27. Even they banded together and swore an oath with fasting and everything that they're not going to eat and drink until they kill Paul. This, this is really what was the objective of Satan. Behind man's plans are Satan's initiations and Satan's uh, kingdom trying to destroy the Apostle Paul, thinking that if they kill the man, they might kill off the gospel. But little do they know that, and, and Paul knew this very well, when they killed Stephen, they did not uh, at all stop the witness of the gospel. In fact, it was one of the pre-conversion steps of the conversion of Paul the Apostle. So we can see constantly what's taking place here in the book of Acts is um, incredible escape. That Paul made escapes time and time again. If you were to go through the doctrine of the grace escape through the book of Acts, you would see in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5, they escaped prison two times. They were arrested, they got out, they were arrested again, they got out. And then we see Paul escaping Jerusalem. They were trying to kill him when he, when he was preaching. He preached in Damascus, they tried to kill him. He escaped Damascus. He came to Jerusalem. They tried to kill him in Jerusalem. Imagine how intimidated the devil was by this man. Huh? Tried to kill him in Damascus, kill him in Jerusalem. Then they sent him to Caesarea, and they had to get him out of there too. And they finally, he finally went to Tarsus, which was his hometown, far away and kind of like nobody would chase him down there. And so even when he came back, and uh, he came back to Antioch in Acts chapter 11, you can see every step that he took, involving missions, there was always an escape that had to be made. Every, every time he was in Iconium, they said the gods have come down to us from Lystra. The gods have come down to us from heaven. And then the crowd turned everything around and they stoned him to death. And he had to flee Iconium. Then he got arrested in uh, Philippi in Acts 16 and he escaped the prison. 
In Acts 17 in Thessaloniki, same thing happened again. He got driven out of town. He had to escape with his life. Acts chapter 18, he had to escape Corinth with his life. Just everywhere, riots and problems. Acts 19, the silversmith riot, and they're screaming, great is Diana of the Ephesians, and they've got to get him out of there really quick. And so he comes to Jerusalem, and it happens again. And this will happen to him till he goes home to be with the Lord. And so he's always experiencing this incredible grace of God that he would escape the plan of the devil and man's uh, help as man is used by the enemy to try to destroy this man, but he has no victory and he does not bring it to pass. And I, I was thinking about uh, today uh, how God puts met people in unique places. In Acts chapter, and these verses are incredible, but in Acts chapter 23, verse uh, 22, verse 24, 22, 24, and 26 through 29. Am I going too fast? Are you with me? 22, 24, 26 through 21, 29, 23, 10, 15, 17 and 19. 23, 22, 24, 7, 24, 22, and 25, 23. Say, what are all those verses about? Well, if you, have, if you didn't get them, get a concordance and read about the chief captain. I mean, over and over again, seven or eight times it's mentioned the chief captain Lysias rescued the Apostle Paul. God had a man, had a man there for some reason. He didn't even, I mean, he didn't have to do it. He didn't have to go as far as he would. He would even appear when Paul was making defenses and when Paul went to Caesarea, the chief, the captain was there. So God had people in places so that Paul would escape the plan of the enemy. Very unique people in unique places. And Jesus told them in Acts 23, 11, you're going to testify of me in Rome after you testify of me in Jerusalem. He got a vision in 23, 11 in the night. And God spoke to him. And God would use people. Remember when they wanted to kill him, how his sister's son saved his life? What was his sister doing in Jerusalem? What was his sister's son doing in that particular place? This is something that is ordained by God so he can make a what? An escape. He can make an escape. So we've got the chief captain Lysias. We've got the nephew. In Acts 23, verse 16, we have a centurion who goes in to rescue him when he finds out about the plot to kill him with 470 men. Can you imagine that? Right in Jerusalem, God raises up a centurion to rescue him. Just like he did on the boat. Remember? They said, kill the prisoners and let's, let's end this. And the centurion, Paul said to the centurion, unless we abide in the boat, we cannot be saved. And the centurion agreed with the apostle Paul and they made it safe to land and he got him another ship. Are you there? So God is using people. The chief captain Lysias, a Roman then he's using his nephew and his, his sister. Then he's using a centurion and 470 men. Then he's using another centurion in the boat. Then he's using Aristarchus and Luke who travel with him. So God has men in specific places as he is actually engineering his plan. Isn't that good? And these are things that, you, that Paul did not really know about. And there's going to be things that happen in our lives when, when all kinds of things come our way that God has arranged and ordained people that would be there for us so that we would make a great escape or a grace escape. And this is really incredible as you look through uh, the book of Acts. You'll see continuously the apostles and men of God and people of God able to escape the very hand of the enemy who would like to destroy them. And we don't even have any idea in our lives how many times we've escaped. You, cause we don't know the unseen world. We don't, we don't always, we're not always aware of the enemy's plan, whether it's uh, airplane crashes, whether it's accidents, whether it's this or that. 
that there's plans to literally try to destroy the believer's life. Maybe his fruitfulness, maybe his very life and whatnot, but God has specific people in specific places like he had for the Apostle Paul that his plan had set them in place. They were just waiting right there. I remember one time when I was, um, I was uh, being sought after by the police in a certain country in Africa. And I was with my wife, and she said to me, we're going to the border, and I know they've already radioed ahead at the border, and they, they know you're coming. So what are we going to do? I said, I really believe, Linda, that God's going to blind all the border people and immigration people. Let's just walk right through without even stopping with our passports. She goes, what? I said, just follow me. And I had all the luggage, and we went right over the border and right into the next border. And she says, how do we do that? I said, I just told you that we just walk. I don't care about the law. I don't care about what is the right thing to do. I know God is telling me, you can't stop here. These people have got your passport number. And if you stop here to come out of the country, I remember one night I was uh, crossing a border at 12.30 at night because I was being hunted. And uh, I, somehow I was with a man who was a, uh, he was a customs agent who was in the church. God had placed him in the church. And uh, he said to me, you got a problem? I'll take you to the border. We got to the border. The border was closed. So I decided to go down. There's another way to go over the border. And it was down into a, a, a valley and come up out of the valley. So we go down this thing. I slide all the way down the hill, right, with my luggage and everything. And it's pitch dark out. And I'm with Bernard, the customs agent. And a uh, great basketball player, too. I trained him. That's why he was good. And uh, it was an awesome forward. He played with uh, my son, and we, we had a great team. So we get down, and we're going up the hill, and all of a sudden, I hear a click. I hear rifles being cocked. I said, oh, great. This is great. So there's four soldiers, and they stop us. And they were the soldiers from the country we were entering into illegally. Every right to shoot you. They have every right to shoot you. And they could get away with it. So the guy says to me, what are you doing? What's going on here? And, you know, I just thought to myself, I'm a pastor. Okay, I'm leaving this other country, which I know you don't like too much. All right, and I'm going to your country because I feel I can be safe there. All right? So he says, empty your pockets. And he goes through my luggage. And listen to what happened. I had $5,000 in cash on me. We're talking about people that get paid 40 bucks a month. Are you with me? They got rifles. It's 12 o'clock at night, and I'm in no man's land. And I'm like, what? so the guy takes the money. He says, you can go your way. I said, sir, first of all, I'd like to tell you that I'm a pastor. I said, and do you know that if you steal money from God and the church, that you'll have a curse on your life and your family and your children and your children's children all the way down for the next five generations. He looked at me. He gave me the money back. He said, go your way. I gave him a $100 bill and said, God bless you. And I, and I, I thought to myself, we got up the thing and into, a, into the city and whatnot. Like, tell me, I, I mean, I could feel a sweat coming down my... Like, size that it's not that, like, there was, of course, there was fear. Of course, there was anticipation, anxiety. But we escaped. That one soldier happened to be a believer. And he understood what curses and blessings meant. And don't ask me why I said that. I said it because God told me to say it, and it was effective. So I wouldn't say that. What are you telling people? They're going to be cursed? Yeah. Yeah. Better than dying, wasn't it? At that particular point. So God has, God has placed certain people in certain places. And we, I really believe that. I really believe that so that we don't get so bent out of shape and we don't see things working out the way they should. They're trying to kill Paul. You know, I, I, so, so often I, I guess I, I, I need to grow. I need to go on with God in areas of my life. But I get like so provoked with such petty, petty problems that people have. I mean, especially in the West. They have such... Petty, petty things. And it's like, oh, come on. If you can't get over this thing, 
How in God's name are you going to walk with him? This is just an obstacle to test your faith. You know? So you're, you didn't get the money you thought was due you from somebody you work with. All right? Or something happened in a relationship. In the marriage, you're like at war over who drives the newer car. Uh, there's, there's, there's issues about prayer. And I'm, and I'm like, wow, is, like, do, you, do we under, and I understand that too. I know that people have to grow. I'm talking about when I see people that have been believers for years getting so upset because somebody didn't say hi to them. Like, I, really, you didn't recognize me. Well, I probably didn't see you. you know, like. So all through the book of Acts, you see God with his plan and his counsel, of, the counsel of the Lord, it shall stand, and how he is just delivering people. I really believe that God will do that in our lives, and he places people in our past, and he will do that for years and years and decades to come. And so often we fail. How, how's this going to work? Oh, just, just relax. Just trust God. Because God has an escape plan that you know nothing of. He has an escape plan that you know nothing of. One time I was being fingerprinted in a place because um, I was handcuffed and brought into this place. And the guy that was fingerprinting me was holding my hands. And I said, have you ever considered the hands of Jesus, how they were crucified? And they, uh, uh, the, the nails went right through his hands. He said, would you shut up? I said, have you ever considered, like, his hands? The guy was really getting aggravated, you know. And he came back to me later. He says, like, you know what? You're telling me the same thing my mother told me for 20 years. He said, what are you doing here? I said, God had me arrested to talk to you. Because then I was, like, free within, like, about, a, you know, three hours. It was just this one guy. I don't even know how the whole thing happened. It was the craziest event that took place. And I found myself in a place, and God said, no, you're here for this person. To witness to this person because you, I'm honoring the prayers of his mother. How's that one, huh? That's an escape. That's a, that's a grace escape. And uh, it's incredible. So we see God engineering these situations and how they're taking place. Now turn with me to Ezra chapter 9. That's in the, what you call the Old Testament. What I call the Bible. <laughs> I'm just playing. Let me play. Mentally. Now Ezra, if you know the story of Ezra, he was brought to Babylon when he was 16 or 17 years old. He was physically abused and sexually abused on the way. He was brought into captivity, and yet he wrote, he wrote much, he wrote so much. He's the one that wrote Psalm 119. We all, everybody thinks it was David. It was Ezra. Ezra wrote Psalm 119. And Ezra wrote many things in the scriptures. And Ezra was the first time that there was ever a priest and a scribe that held the same office. He was a scribe and a priest. It meant he was an interpreter and preacher of the Bible. And Ezra in Babylon, they are the, the people of God are a mess. There's just nothing but sin and iniquity everywhere. And they are living in captivity. And I want, you to, I want to read Ezra chapter 9, starting in verse 1. I want you to see how many things are wrong with the people of God in the first seven verses. I counted about 10 or 12 things that are, that are total, like one of them would devastate anybody and, and God's people. But let's read Ezra chapter 9. We're talking about escape. Okay? We're talking about a grace escape. And that's what the book of Acts was all about, all the way to the end, when he gets off the boat. So Ezra chapter 9, verse 1. When these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yes, the hand of the princes and rulers has been chief in this trespass. Imagine that. They were told not to intermarry, and the hand of the rulers was right on top of everything. They were the biggest offenders. 
When I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and I sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. He was overwhelmed. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness. I want you to think of these words. Transgression, astonished, heaviness, the, the sin. I arose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. And I said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to you, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our heads, and our, of our head, and our trespass is grown up into the heavens. Since the days of our fathers, we have been in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to spoil, to confusion of face, as it is this day. This is a pretty grievous situation, wouldn't you say? Hmm? But watch what God does. I love this, I love this verse. And now for a little space. In the Hebrew translation, that's a brief moment. In a brief moment, grace has been shown us from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape. All right? Listen, in the middle of this, we are in Babylon. We are, iniquities are above our heads. We are astonished. We can't lift our face to heaven. We are blushed. We, he's rent his clothes uh, in, in, in just like, I can't even believe what's taking place. It's great trespass. It's above our heads. It's iniquity. It's evil. And the leaders are the key in that. You'd almost think this is almost like an irreparable situation. How do we get out of this? Besides the 70 years of captivity, not only are they in 70 years of captivity, but this is also going on in their lives. And here's the man who literally is going to be instrumental in leading them back. And he says, but for a brief moment, for a little space, grace has been shown us from the Lord our God to give us a what? A remnant to escape. I like the second part. This is eternal security. The first one is salvation, a remnant to escape. They got... In other words, we're getting delivered. To give us a what? A nail in a sure place. What do you think that means? Security. A nail in a sure place. That's, the, that's Calvary. That's the cross. A nail in a sure place. That God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God has not forsaken us in our bondage, but has extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us a reviving and to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. That's amazing. In other words, what a mess. But look what God does. Look at how they are able to escape. You know, if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, you will see a six-point indictment against the believer. Have you ever read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3? And what it says... What it says about we are dead in trespasses and sins. We are walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So we're talking about our position is we're dead and we're in our trespasses and sins. We are controlled by the world and the devil. That's what our walk is all about. We are, we are given over to the lusts of our flesh and of our own minds. And we are by nature the children of wrath. We are a mess. Then it says, but God, right? Here comes the escape, right? But God, who is rich in mercy for the great love where we thee loved us with, by grace are we saved through faith. And here comes, the, here comes the escape. Here comes the escape for the believer. And you can take a look at it, and we realize our old sin nature and the devil and the world system, all of them trying to destroy our lives and keep us in captivity. And so we're talking about an application, not just of the book of Acts, but we have been involved in a grace escape. Amen? And by the way, just because we've escaped doesn't mean the enemy is not still trying to formulate a plan to put us in what? 
some form of bondage, right? To keep us in situations. And the very same way that we escaped, we escaped hell, and we escaped the world system, and we escaped the old sin nature in the flesh, is the very same way we will escape every other thing that happens in our lives. How will a person escape failure and sin? By the mercy of God. How will a person escape being controlled by his flesh? By God himself. It's a, it's a great escape. It's a great escape. And so we can see through the scriptures. Isn't this, you know, one of the saddest things that I read from the book of Genesis is when Lot was given a last chance. Okay, you made a wrong move in going to Sodom. And even when you make wrong moves, have you ever made a wrong move? Don't admit it, no. Ever make a wrong move? No? Don't, don't, no, don't get subjective in your thinking and then re go through all of your problems in your past and try to figure out where you're going to be at now. You know, knock that stuff off, okay? And, and after all that he did, he set his eyes towards Sodom. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. He went to live in Sodom. He became a judge at the gate in Sodom. He was willing to give his daughters over to you know what, strangest things, right? And then even God says, I'm coming and I'm going to get you out of here. Don't look back. And here's what God said in Genesis 19, escape to the mountain. I've got an escape for you, Lot. Lot, remember what? Remember Lot's what? What did she do? You could take her out of Sodom, but you couldn't take Sodom out of her. Are you with me? You can take people out of the world, but can you take the world out of them? It takes God, doesn't it? And you know what happened. She died on the spot, became a pillar of salt. He ended up taking his two daughters and having sex with his own daughters because he got drunk and created Moab and Ammon, which are with us today. And you, if you take a look at the news, you'll know who they are. Okay? God even was willing to give the whole family an escape. Just get out. But see, they, they, they were infected by this. And so, an escape. Turn to Psalm 46. All through the scriptures, we can see. Genesis chapter 6. What was the, what was the grace escape in Genesis 6 verse 5? But Noah what? Huh? Noah What? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, right? What was God going to do to the world, by the way? Destroy it. Thank you. But Noah had a, a what? A grace ark, didn't he? Took his whole family inside and they did what? What, did, what happened? They escaped, didn't they? They escaped. It's incredible. We were talking on Grace Hour today about, you know, if you ever meet people, they always want to know, well, well what are the signs of the end days? You know, is it Israel, the fig tree in the land? Is it earthquakes and famines? Is it wars? Is it Europe? Is it the, is it the revived Roman Empire? Is it Gog and Magog? You know what the major sign of the last days is? Deception. Deception. Just read it in Matthew 24. It says it five or six times in principle about seven. The abomination of desolation is in the holy place. Be not deceived. Deception is the sign of the end times. How do we escape deception? How does a person escape deception? Self-deception, satanic deception. Are you with me? Don't float in your minds. There's a few of you that are like mentally not even here. You say, how would you know? I do. I just know. Okay? I don't want to tell you who it is. Sometimes God just gave, gives you like illumination on where people's minds are thinking. And I even forgot what I was saying. Imagine that. Yeah, self-deception, satanic deception, world deception. It's everywhere. It's deception, and I get deceived. And you know what the word deceived means? It's, very, it's a very simple explanation for what it means to be deceived. Literally, I, I just don't know what I'm doing. I'm totally taken over by another kingdom. Deception is something that a person doesn't recognize. If they did, they wouldn't be what? Deceived. deceived. They're just deceived. You tell people that, and they like, look at you like, oh, don't give me that, you know? Judging me. No, you're deceived. You're emotionally deceived, mentally deceived. You're deceived in your will. You're deceived in your, uh, your, your self-image. You're deceived. Deception. 
And there's an escape, isn't there? By the way, how do you escape deception? Doctrine. Huh? Truth. Doctrine. Grace. Finished work. Body life. Involvement with the gospel. Not by saying, God, forgive me for my deception. It's not just confession and prayer. You know, a lot of people think they can come back through just confession and prayer. You can get right in a moment before God, but if you're going to have victory, you need to be submitted to doctrinal thinking and be in a place where you're learning the Word of God. That's the only way you get delivered from deception. It doesn't come by a prayer. Oh, God. You know, somebody leaves, lives deceased for 10 years and says, Oh, God, just for, uh, deliver me from deception. Amen. You, Dr. Stevens always said you submit to the what? The pulpit, right? You study the Bible. You, you submit to doctrine and the pulpit and the word of God, and you will be delivered from deception. A great escape. Like we were talking about uh, on the radio the other day, where in Africa they, they have these prosperity preachers preaching that Jesus uh, wore a designer robe because it had no seam. And they said his donkey was like a Mercedes Benz, so you ought to get a Mercedes Benz. When he came, when he came down uh, on, on the donkey on that day that coming into Jerusalem, it was the equivalency of having a Mercedes Benz. And then they, pray, they have certain days which they call breakthrough days. And you, come, you come there and thousands of people come and you're going to get your breakthrough for money and blessing and all this. What a lot of nonsense. What a lot. You know what? It's all over Africa. It makes me vomit. I vomit when I, see, I, I look at it. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. People are really that stupid. They believe that stuff. They always use 3 John 2, you know. I desire that you prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. They don't even have an idea what that says in the Greek language. The word is, is having a prosperous journey and a walk with God. It has nothing to do with your financial capabilities. Deception. People need to escape it, right? As, by the way, the, in that message, there's no place for the poor. All they do is get condemned. Just condemned by that. I haven't got anything, so I must be in sin, under Satan's kingdom, and living outside of who God is. There's no place for people like that at all. So Psalm 46, are you with me? Okay, verse 1. God is our refuge and our strength. What kind of a help? A very... Boy, Paul knew this, didn't he? Imagine in Acts 9 and 2 Corinthians 11, he got let down by a basket over a wall through a window. You ever had a problem? Uh, try getting let down in a basket through a window over a wall in the city. Imagine that. That didn't stop him. A very, what kind of help? Very present help. Where's God? Where's God in this problem? Oh, you know what? Now, don't get upset. By the way, I, I say these things because a lot of times I'm preaching at darkness, not at you. Because it's just trying to get people. You know what I mean? You preach against atmospheres when you preach. Some people get so offended if you get a little bit loud, motivational, and a little bit upset and angry. It's okay to be angry at sin, isn't it? Oh, what happened to you? Did you have a problem with your wife today? <laughs> no, I've never had a problem with my wife. Never, you know? So I don't know what you're talking about. It's just, it's just the message, you know? You could have been here 30 years ago and Pastor Stevens would shave you without a razor. You'd be like, look, you'd be looking to go underneath the table. Some of the modern Christians couldn't even handle it. They'd be crying, weeping, and go looking for a ministry where they could sleep on a pillow during church. I don't want that kind of church. By the truth and sell that. Very present help. Isn't that great? I mean, a very present help in time of what? Time of trouble. He's our, he's our refuge and our strength. A very present help. That means, will, will he help you when you need a financial escape? Huh? And if he doesn't, don't get bent out of shape about you know, the decisions you're making and where you're at spiritually and start analyzing yourself and evaluating yourself, condemning yourself and beating yourself up. He's a very present, what? Help in time of trouble. I love that. Therefore will, we not, will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though, all, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah, there is a river 
the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that when? Right early. Very present, right early. God is right there. Paul's nephew was right there when he needed him. The centurion was right there when it was time. Lysias the captain took him with the soldiers and put him up in the air. He had to put him up in the air to get him out from the crowd who was looking to tear his body to pieces. Right there, very present help in time of trouble. Right there with an earthquake in the, in the, uh, in the jail in Philippi. Right there when Peter is going to be killed in Acts chapter 12. Right there in Corinth to get him out of the city in the nick of time. Right there when he's uh, being stoned in Lystra, dragged back into the, uh, dragged out of the city, and then walks back. And he's he's right there on the boat at the last. Minute. God's right there, a very present help in time of trouble. It's a grace escape. Wasn't God right there when you called upon Him and got saved? He said, "Excuse me, could you wait a while? I'll get back to you with that prayer." And Jesus, come into my life and save me. I believe in who you are and the cross and the cleansing of the blood of Christ and the mercy of God. And God said, excuse me, but you're going to have to wait a while. Hey, take a ticket. Okay, go, go around, like when you go around McDonald's and you get the other window and I'll see you a little bit later. Huh? No. You had a grace escape when you got saved, didn't you? Huh? You, do you know what, what you escaped? Escaped hell. Escaped having no purpose. Escaped uh, all kinds of things. A very present help in time of trouble. He will help her and write early. The heathen raged. That's the nations. Any nations raging today? Who gives a flying rip about nations raging and all the politics and all the garbage that's going on? Oh my God, look at the economy. Look what's going on. They're putting signboards up saying that we should all get together and don't believe in God. You think I care? A fool has said in his heart there is no God. You're just a fool. Just a pack of fools, I said it on Grace Hour today. A pack of fools. Heathen raging, nations raging. We'll get rid of Christians. We'll wipe them out. Yeah, they're doing a good job in China. They're getting saved by the millions in China. They can't stop them. Huh? Can't stop them. Nations, the heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I love it. Look at verse 10. Be still. Waiting for an escape? Huh? Wondering what's happening? How about this? this? Isn't this good counsel? Be still and know that I am God. You know what? People that can't be still never know God. Save people that cannot be still can never know God. In their circumstance. He says, be still and know that I am God. Not, be, not know the situation, not know the sin, not know the problem, not know somebody else's failure, not know somebody else's faults, not know uh, all that's taking place in circumstances and trials and tests. Be still and know that I am God. Isn't that good? That's what you're supposed to do. Be still and know God. I understand! You don't get it. You haven't passed through this way. Oh, come on. You know what? You think you're the only person that's ever gone through what you're going through? You're so arrogant. I said, people, there have been people like you for 6,000 years. Just manifest itself another way. Oh, you know? Yes, you're the only one with this problem that's ever existed on planet Earth. <laughs> God, be still. That's a, you know, that, that's a nice way of saying, shut up. <laughs> shut up. And listen to God. You can't hear God if you're always talking. You know what noisy brains are? Anybody here got one? Don't raise your hand. Just noise. Can't, you can't. How can you hear God? It's like always noise, 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 noise. Be still and know that I am God. Why? He's a refuge and a strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our what? Is my escape. Did you ever read about the six cities of refuge in Joshua chapter 20? Anybody ever read that? Raise your hand. Hmm. Read your Bible. 
Read your Bible. I love it. Six cities of refuge where somebody that was accused of murder could go to that city. If you got to that city, you're safe. And you had to make sure that all the roads that went there were passable. Not like the craters that we have in uh, some places around the world. And you gotta go. No, these were straight roads right to the city. Okay, listen to, listen to the names of these cities. I love these names. They all mean something. There were three cities on one side of the Jordan and three cities on the other. And you could, and within one half a day, you could get there. So no matter what happened to you, before somebody could kill you, you got to the city, they couldn't touch you. You got to the city, they couldn't touch you without a fair trial. But you had to get to the city. All right? The, first, the name of the first city was Kadesh. Kadesh means holiness. That's a city of refuge, isn't it? We escape into the holiness of God. Because we are not holy, but God is holy. And the Holy Spirit, who lives in you when you're saved? The what spirit? I'm oh, just so wicked and evil. And I'm so unrighteous. And, well, guess what? Huh, is that a new revelation to you? Would you just figure that out recently? He, the one who lives in you is holy. God gives you the person of the Holy Spirit. So your holiness is a gift of God. Kadesh means holiness. That's a ref God's holiness is a refuge for me. You got that? Yeah, even with your haircut, you got that, right? It's awesome. Number two, the second city was Shechem. Shechem. And that means where God shoulders your burden. Isn't that good? God shoulders your burden. It's a, it's a place where God takes your burdens. He shoulders your burdens. That's a refuge for me. When I've got burdens and I've got problems, you know what God says? Come to Shechem. It's a city of refuge. It's a, an escape for you. You come to that city. You've been charged, even if it's rightly that you've been charged, come to Shechem. It's a city of refuge. Next one, Hebron. Hebron is the place of fellowship with God. It's a city of refuge. I escape by having fellowship with God. Isn't that interesting? How many people have misinterpreted 1 Corinthians 10, 13? No test or trial given to man is common to man, but God provides a way of escape. What's the way of escape, pastor? How do I get out of this? Well, how do I, what's the way of escape? I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way is Christ. What, are you looking for something else? You want an easy way out, right? And you know what? You try to counsel people, and they want to they escape a problem, escape a situation. You know what the escape is? Christ. Jesus Christ. I am the way. He will give you a way of escape, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that you may be able to bear any test or trial. He's saying something that nobody wants to hear. Not nobody, but a lot of people. There is no test or trial that will face you that's common to man that God will not provide you a way of escape. You'll never be in a place where you can't bear it. Because God's not going to... God, God sets the thermometer of your furnace. Did you hear what I just said? God sets the thermometer of your furnace. He knows what you can take. He's not going to burn you or break you. A bruised reed he shall not break. Smoking flax he will not put out till he sends forth judgment unto victory. Matthew 12, 20. He doesn't break you. He's not trying to break you that way. Hebron, fellowship with God. My way out of this escape for Paul was getting to know God. How do I escape this problem? Get to know God. How do I escape this personality conflict? Get to know God. How do I escape this old sin nature? Get to know God. How do I escape this thorn in the flesh? Get to know God. Hello? Anybody here tonight? Are you here? How do I, how do I, how do I, how do I, how do I? Why don't you write a book on how do I, how do I, how do I? Wow, God, how, how? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. You've got to come with Christ to the Father. So how do I get out of my situations and my problems and my trials and my difficulty? And can I tell you something? We are appointed to these our whole life. I can't wait till this one's over. There's more coming, baby. There's more coming. 
I don't like that kind of Christianity. I don't like that kind of Christianity. I want a nice one that nothing ever happens. Everything is beautiful. Blue clouds, white sky, you know, nice 72 degrees. Oh, everything's wonderful. Oh, come on. You're looking at, go be a Muslim. <laughs> go, go, go become a religious person or something like that. Is that what you're looking for? Nirvana? I don't know. <sighs> Hebron, fellowship with God, right? That's the key. Paul had fellowship with God. He heard words that were unspeakable, 2 Corinthians 12, 4 and 5, that were is a, not lawful for a man to speak. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. He said, in the middle of all these trials and problems, <laughs> meet me. Okay? Get to know me. Hebron. Are you with me? Hebron. Fellowship with God. Fellowship with God. Next, the next one. I will take a break. As soon as I'm done with this, maybe. Next city. Bezier. B-E-Z-E-R. That means fortress and protection. I escape. God protects me. I escape through God's protection. B-E-Z-E-R. It's the next city of refuge. I escape. I make a grace escape to God's protection. God protects us. The next city, Ramoth, R-A-M-O-T-H. It means high place. Finished work. High place. This is on the other side of the Jordan. High place. My, my grace escape is to my position in Christ. Not so you try to beat me up in my experience. My escape is to my high place. My place in Christ. I am seated together in heavenly places. And then finally, Golan. G-O-L-A-N. It means joy. <laughs> I escape with God the Spirit's joy. I've got the joy of the Lord in the midst of all this taking place. Acts 16, he's praising God. Ezra, physically and sexually abused. Joy, praising the Lord. Getting to know God. Getting to know God. So, this is the great grace of escape. Father, bless our time and our break right now. Bring us back with an understanding of fellowship about the grace escape. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Take 10.